Do you feel like something about you repels good things from happening in your life? Does it feel like when you are about to make some progress, you are met with a brick wall? Does it feel like you are always stuck? Some say it feels like taking one step forward and 10 steps backwards. Whatever the case may be, this message is coming to you to break the cycle of frustration. Indeed, it is very frustrating being stuck in a never-ending cycle of fruitless toil and struggle. Paul cites a similar thing in Romans chapter 7, verse 15. I do not understand what I do. For what I want to do, I do not do. But what I hate, I do. And he exclaims in verse 24, What a wretched man I am! Who will rescue me from this body that is subject to death? But just like Paul's story ended in victory, God is about to use this video to guide you to your own victory in Christ. You are about to experience the touch of God's transforming power that will move you from less to more and from fruitlessness to productivity. There is a prayer at the end of this video for you, so please stay until the end and let God perfect what He is about to start in your life. Does your life feel like a maze or a frustrating cycle that is almost impossible to change? Is it possible that there is something holding you back from breaking free and enjoying all the blessings God's Word says are yours and those you see in the lives of others? Yes, it is possible. It is true that there could be things in your life standing in the way of God's blessing coming into your life. Psalm chapter 78 verse 41 says, Yes, again and again they tempted God and limited the Holy One of Israel. I know other translations use different words instead of the word limited, but no matter what term is used, we can get an idea of what this verse means. The phrase, limited the Holy One of Israel, refers to the Israelites' lack of faith in God's ability to provide despite His many miracles and blessings for them. This phrase has been interpreted in different ways by theologians and scholars. Some believe it refers to the Israelites' attempts to control God or limit His power through disobedience and unbelief. Others suggest it means that the Israelites failed to recognize God's sovereignty and greatness and thus limited their own understanding of Him. Regardless of its interpretation, Psalm chapter 78 verse 41 serves as a reminder of the importance of faith, trust, and obedience in our relationship with God. It also highlights the consequences of doubting God's power and provision, which can lead to spiritual stagnation, fear, and unbelief. Now, this verse is so noteworthy because the Bible says something of our identity and privileges in Christ. In Ephesians chapter 1, verse 3, it says, Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. Take note of these words here. God has already blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. But the question is, just like the Israelites, are you receiving those blessings in your life or are you blocking them? Every day, one way or the other, the things you do or don't do contribute to either open you up to God's blessings or shut you out of them. In a world riddled with too many options, God counsels us to make the right choice. And what should be the center of every choice we make? To honor and please God above all else. Why? Because our life depends on Him. This is the focus of everything I will say today. Deuteronomy chapter 30 verses 19 through 20 says, This day I call the heavens and the earth as witnesses against you that I have set before you life and death, blessings and curses. Now choose life, so that you and your children may live and that you may love the Lord your God. Listen to His voice and hold fast to Him. For the Lord is your life, and He will give you many years in the land He swore to give to your fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. You can see how choosing life over death and good over evil can affect not only your own life but the lives of those around you, including your children and the coming generations. In a world that has watered down things like choices and consequences, we must choose things that lead to life. Each time we choose the wrong side, choose death, or choose any way that doesn't align with God, we take a stance that blocks His blessings from coming into our lives. Today, I hope to help you see what you can do and how you can do them so that you can unblock those blessings in your life. You are meant for great things, 
and these words will bring you into them in Jesus' name. I want you to understand you must avoid the seductive force of temptation to unblock yourself from God's blessings. Everyone on earth knows what it means to be tempted. It is a universal struggle. When the Bible was telling us how to deal with the devil, I love how it tells us that we are not alone in our struggle against the enemy. 1 Peter chapter 5, verses 8-9 through 9 says, Be alert and of sober mind. Your enemy the devil prowls around like a roaring lion, looking for someone to devour. Resist him, standing firm in the faith, because you know that the family of believers throughout the world is undergoing the same kind of sufferings. Temptations are the devil's gateways to lure us into sinful and destructive paths. And if we are going to be very honest with ourselves, as much as temptations differ from person to person, they are those things we know deep down to be wrong and which pull us in regardless. They are those wrong things that, although we hate to do them, like Paul states in Romans 7, we find ourselves doing them and even briefly feeling good about them. But here is the thing about temptations that you need to know, dear friends. Temptations don't come to do you any good. Instead, they come to throw you off the right course where you can't easily get back on track, thereby losing every chance the right path has to offer you. Temptations offer you a quick and easy way to instant gratification, but it is a trap. It is like those little crumbs that lead to a cage. Exposing yourself to one temptation leads you to another, and then another, until you are too far gone. Let me share a little bit about temptation. The Bible says in James chapter 1, verses 13 through 15, When tempted, no one should say, God is tempting me, for God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he tempt anyone. But each person is tempted when they are dragged away by their own evil desire and enticed. Then, after desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is full grown, gives birth to death. Evil, sin, prayerlessness, and pride have their roots in temptation. This scripture tells us that sin is the result of temptation allowed to grow deep within us. And what is the outcome of it? Death, which is separation from God. In other words, it keeps you further and further away until you are too far away to receive the benefits of being connected to Him. Esau gave in to his hunger and fell into a trap to satisfy that momentary hunger. And what did it cost him? His birthright and all the blessings attached to it. It was a disastrous trade-off sacrificing a future filled with promise for a moment of fleeting comfort. Can you imagine how immediate satisfaction can be short-lived but come with a loss that takes years or sometimes a lifetime to recover from? In Esau's case, the loss was permanent. He never got his birthright back. Although temptations will come when you are at your weakest, you must understand and remember this point. There will be consequences and everything has a price. Shortcuts don't always have short effects. Shortcuts are not always the fastest routes. Alleys, though they may be shortcuts, are often full of thieves that can hurt you and take your belongings. Running after or always giving in to those things that tempt you will keep you in a position where you are disconnected from your blessings. Hence, you must know what to do to avoid temptation so that this doesn't happen. First, know what your weaknesses are. When you know what easily tempts you, your battle is already half won. Second, have accountable relationships. When there is someone or multiple people in your life who check to see how you are doing, the chances of going after those negative things that will hurt you will be slim. Third, avoid those things that easily tempt you. If being around someone, somewhere, or something triggers tempting feelings that will result in destructive outcomes, avoidance is the best way to escape. Don't go there and try to fight it. You don't fight every battle. There are battles you run from. Last, arm yourself with the word and with prayer. Jesus overcame Satan's temptations, not by simply quoting scriptures back at the devil, but by understanding what those scriptures meant. Those verses were a response to the devil for the temptation at hand. It is one thing to know many verses and another to know how to apply them. This is easier when you feed on God's Word to make Him your life's guide rather than just to fill your head with words. If you do these things, you will starve and weaken your temptations, thereby reducing your chances of falling into sin. If you have been giving in to too many temptations, it's time for you to repent. 
Repentance is not just feeling bad for giving in to sin or living sinfully. Repentance is deciding not to repeat those sins anymore. Through repentance involves efforts on your part. Start with seeking God for forgiveness and grace to maintain the right path. When you repent, you can put these things I shared into practice and be sure that the Holy Spirit will be present to help you in your moment of need. Let us pray. Father God, I pray for the person listening to me today. I ask mercy on their behalf. They confess that they feel stuck and tired of struggling. But because you have sent them your word today, they believe that you haven't forgotten them. You want them restored and back on the right path. Therefore, I pray for them. Fill them with your grace and strength. Help them to make those conscious decisions to handle and keep temptations at bay. Give them the strength to stand against the devices of the devil and to seek after walking in the path of life. Thank you for doing this today. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. Testimonies are great. When you share them, someone's faith is inspired and God is glorified. David said in Psalm 22, 22 to 25, I will declare your name to my people. In the assembly, I will praise you. You who fear the Lord, praise him. All you descendants of Jacob, honor him. Revere him, all you descendants of Israel. For he has not despised or scorned the suffering of the afflicted one. He has not hidden his face from him, but has listened to his cry for help. From you comes the theme of my praise in the great assembly. Before those who fear you, I will fulfill my vows. Through testimonies, we glorify God and inspire others to trust Him and to glorify Him too. This is a biblically sound example to follow. It's not surprising that we still have time in our services to read or hear someone's testimony. They remind us that God is still working in our midst and that we can trust Him with our own needs, no matter how bad things are. You know that sometimes you can listen to a person's testimony and fall on your knees to thank God. Why? Because you haven't gone through something as difficult as their situation. Such a testimony allows you to strengthen your faith and be filled with thanks rather than complaints. Remember that the Apostle Paul wrote about this in 1 Thessalonians 5.18. Give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. But this isn't what I'm talking about today, dear friend. As great as testimonies are, and while you are encouraged to share them before God's people when your miracles happen, there is something you shouldn't tell people. And that is what you are up to. Your testimony is one thing, and your plan of action, that's another. Don't confuse them for one another. Most believers miss that, and this is why God is sending you this video. In Proverbs 21, 23, the Bible said, those who guard their mouths and their tongues keep themselves from calamity. And in Proverbs 11:13, 13, a talebearer reveals secrets, but he who is of a faithful spirit conceals a matter. Now listen to this. These two verses speak both to you and those you may have around you. We often think that verses like this are only meant for our friends and those with loose tongues. And we forget that we have a role to play in the situation. Think about it this way. Say you have a friend that talks a lot and has very weak control over his mouth. Would you share your deepest secrets with this person? Why not? Yeah, because you know that sharing your deepest secrets with this person would be like placing a plastic container on a stove without expecting it to melt and risk setting the house on fire. So as much as we are to love those around us and be accepting of each other's uniqueness, there are certain things we ought to do in protecting ourselves and others. One of them is never sharing what you're up to with everyone. Now, let me say something that we can never overemphasize. Not everyone in your life is sent by God to help you. Some people in your life are actually there because the devil placed them there, waiting for an opportunity to bring you down. Aside from this truth, 
Another thing to note is that by default, the average individual is selfish. This selfishness is the cause of lust and envy, which lead people to hurt others for their own satisfaction. Remember that the Bible says in Jeremiah 17, 9, the heart is deceitful above all things and beyond cure. Who can understand it? Listen to those words again. The heart is deceitful above all things, and it's not only deceitful, it's so naturally depraved that it's beyond cure, such that the owner cannot understand it. So you may now understand why someone who ate with you, slept in the same bed with you, and walked you through some difficult times would turn and betray you. It's not really their fault. They were probably deceived by their own heart. This is why God commands us to forgive those who wrong us. Sometimes people think that they know what they're doing. And sometimes we ourselves think we understand why they did what they did. But the truth is that some of the worst people on earth never realize the deception of their own hearts until the last minutes of their lives. Or maybe until they encounter the enlightening grace of Jesus that opens our eyes. Therefore, we must be wise as we travel down this path of life. This video is some of the wisdom God's giving you. And we encourage you to take it to heart and let God use these words to save you. You should be careful who you share your plans with. And there are different reasons why you should. However, one of the reasons I want to focus on today is the fact that although someone's close to you, they may not be in the best position to accommodate what you're sharing with them. Let me explain this. You know the story of Joseph and his brothers. The Bible tells us that Joseph shared his dreams with them and they hated him for it and tried to kill him. Now listen, Joseph wasn't sharing a mere dream with his brothers. He knew that and they knew it too. They all knew that Joseph's dreams were prophetic in nature. They were children of a lineage covenanted with God, and they understood the supernatural operations of God that can take someone undeserving and make him a great leader. Their father, Jacob, was a perfect example. They'd watched him enjoy the blessings of God over his brother Esau. They may have even heard the story of the incident with their grandfather, Isaac, so when their brother was telling them that he would one day become someone they'd bow to, a chord was struck in their hearts. But hold on a minute. Let me show you something important. When Joseph shared his second dream with his father and his brothers, Genesis 37, 10 to 11. When he told his father as well as his brothers, his father rebuked him and said, what is this dream you had? Will your mother and I and your brothers actually come and bow down to the ground before you? His brothers were jealous of him, but his father kept the matter in mind. The Bible paints two pictures here. This was the same dream in the same family, but different states of heart. The brothers' hearts abhorred him, but their father's heart took the message in and pondered it. Something similar was also seen in the life of Jesus Christ, our Lord, when he was a child with Mary and Joseph. Luke 2, 48-52 When his parents saw him, they were astonished. His mother said to him, Son, why have you treated us like this? Your father and I have been anxiously searching for you. Why were you searching for me? he asked. Didn't you know I had to be in my father's house? but they did not understand what he was saying to them. Then he went down to Nazareth with them and was obedient to them. But his mother treasured all these things in her heart. And Jesus grew in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and man. With Joseph telling his dreams to his family, Jacob's heart towards his son was good. And Jacob would have been a good guide to help Joseph fulfill his dreams However, his brothers did not have good hearts towards him, so they attacked the dreams. But thank God for saving Joseph. He would have died for sharing his dreams with the wrong people. If Joseph had been wiser, he would have kept his dreams to himself. And if he needed to share them, 
he would have shared them with his father alone. Jacob had years of experience pursuing his dreams with God and could have added some wisdom and support to help his son reach his dreams. Now, in contrast, look at Jesus. Can you see the difference in being surrounded by the right people whose hearts can accommodate what you're up to? Without hesitation or remorse, he told his earthly parents the kind of destiny he had and was living for. Instead of getting mad, his mother treasured those thoughts in her heart. And the result was her support as Jesus grew into that purpose. When you share your plans with someone whose heart is mature and can accommodate them as treasures like Mary did, and not like a burden like Joseph's brothers did, then those plans will succeed and you will grow. If not, you may struggle to fulfill them. This is our message from God to you in this video. This is why you shouldn't tell anyone what you're up to. And if you feel the need to share a plan, do so in order to obtain wisdom and proper guidance or mentorship that will water the plan and give it room to grow. You see, your dreams and plans are treasures given to you by God. Before you share one with someone, first find out, will this person treasure this or will they take it as a burden? This way you can look for not just a listener, but a wise and godly counselor, a mentor, a teacher, and one who can lead you correctly. This is why you need the person of the Holy Spirit. He's your greatest support and guide. The greater the destiny given to you, the easier it'll be for you to fall. So be careful and don't play around with your plans. God takes you seriously. The Bible says that a fool is always babbling but a wise person keeps things in their heart for the appointed time. I pray that from today, the Holy Spirit of God will fill your heart with wisdom to keep your plans and dreams to yourself. I pray for the discernment to know those whose hearts are mature enough to receive the message you're sharing with them as a treasure to be protected and nurtured. Throughout our journey, we often find ourselves standing at crossroads, facing decisions that can shape our lives. We yearn for a sign, a signal from God Himself, guiding us towards the right choice. So, how can we discern the signs that God is saying yes to our next decision? Think about the Israelites during their exodus from Egypt. They were led by a pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night, a tangible, undeniable sign of God's guidance. But in our daily lives, how can we experience such clear direction? I firmly believe that God speaks to us through His Word. The Bible, often referred to as the lamp to our feet and the light to our path, is a profound source of wisdom. When you immerse yourself in Scripture, you'll find that it holds timeless truths and unveils God's divine plan. Now, here's where it gets interesting. Imagine your life as a puzzle and God's Word as the missing piece. When you align your decisions with His teachings, it's like that puzzle piece sliding into place, completing the picture. It's a sign that you're walking the path God intends for you. But wait, there's more. The Amplified Translation of Proverbs chapter 15, verse 22 delivers a powerful message. Without consultation and wise advice, plans are frustrating, but with many counselors, they are established and succeed. God often confirms His guidance through the counsel of fellow believers. When you seek wisdom from those who share your faith and they resonate with the direction you're considering, it's a profound sign that you're on the right path. Consider this journey like a treasure hunt, and God is leaving breadcrumbs along the way. His Word is your treasure map, and the wise counsel of others are those markers guiding you closer to your goal. As you decipher these signs, You'll find yourself not just making decisions, but co-creating your destiny with the divine. So, as you stand on the threshold of your next decision, remember this. God is communicating with you through His Word, and He's echoing His wisdom through the voices of faithful companions. These signs are His way of saying yes. Embrace them, trust in His guidance, and step forward with confidence. When you look back at your journey, You'll see that God was using your experiences, your decisions, and even your doubts to prepare you for something great. 
You are on a path paved with divine purpose, and every step you take is a step towards a future filled with His blessings. God's Word isn't just a book, it's a love letter, a divine message meant to illuminate our path. It's like having a GPS specifically designed by the Creator of the universe. When we're pondering life-altering decisions, consulting the Bible should be our first step. So, if you're wondering whether God is saying yes to you or your next decision, let's dive into how His Word can be the guiding light you've been seeking. Imagine you're planning a grand expedition. Before you embark on this journey, wouldn't you carefully examine the map to ensure you're heading in the right direction? God's Word is your spiritual map, guiding you towards a life that glorifies Him. When you're unsure whether God is saying yes or no, remember this. He'll never lead you down a path that contradicts His Word. His guidance aligns with His commands. So, when faced with a decision, open your Bible and search for His wisdom. Let's not forget that God's Word is alive and active, ready to provide you with the wisdom you need for every decision. In Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12, it says, For the Word of God is alive and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. It's like a spiritual treasure chest waiting to be explored. Think of the Bible as your personal love letter from the Lord. It's filled with His promises, His guidance, and His heart. When you open its pages, you're connecting with the one who knows your past, present, and future. So, before you make that life-altering decision, immerse yourself in the scriptures. Seek out the verses that resonate with your situation. Let God's word speak to your heart and confirm his yes. As you delve into his word, remember the promise from Psalm 119 verse 105. Your word is a lamp for my feet and a light on my path. It's not just a light, it's a radiant beacon that will shine upon your path and reveal God's yes. In conclusion, when you seek God's approval for your next decision, remember that His guidance is intricately woven into His Word. It's your roadmap, your love letter, and your spiritual GPS. Don't venture into the unknown without it. Consult His Word, and you'll find that when God is saying yes, His Word will confirm it, guiding you towards a life that aligns with His perfect plan. When God says yes to your decisions, He lights your path forward. When you seek God's guidance in the choices you make, it's like embarking on a grand adventure, not knowing what lies ahead. But here's the beauty of it. When God says yes to your decisions, He doesn't leave you stumbling in the dark. No, my friends. He lights up your path in the most marvelous ways. Think of it as God playing matchmaker in the grand theater of life. Just like in dating, when you pray about your next decision and God nods His approval, you'll start seeing signs everywhere, just like sparks flying between two people in love. Imagine you're contemplating a relationship with someone named Ebony. If God is giving you the green light, you'll notice that Ebony's heart is open too. It's as if your energies align, and suddenly the idea of dating each other becomes a shared dream. That's God's yes in action, my friends. Or... Let's say you're considering taking things to the next level with Roberto. If God's giving you his blessing, you'll see him taking steps in the same direction. It's like two synchronized dancers moving to the same rhythm. Both of you eagerly stepping towards that beautiful destination called a relationship. What about those times when God closes a door? Well, that's a sign too. A crystal clear message from above. It's like God gently guiding you away from a path that might not be the best for you. It's his way of saying, my child, I have something better in store for you. You see, sometimes we're so determined to get what we want that we keep knocking on doors that God has firmly shut. We waste precious time and energy pursuing things that are not part of his divine plan. But my dear friends, when God closes a door, don't resist it. Embrace it. Trust that he's protecting you from something that might not be for your highest good. Now, let's turn to the Bible for some wisdom. Proverbs chapter 3, verses 5-6 through 6 reminds us, Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways submit to Him, and He will make your paths straight. 
This verse beautifully illustrates how God guides us, lighting our way when we trust Him wholeheartedly. So, the next time you're faced with a decision, seek God's counsel. Pray, listen, and watch for those signs. When God says yes, you'll know it because the path before you will be illuminated with His love and blessings. But when He gently closes a door, trust that He's guiding you towards something even more extraordinary. Remember, my friends, when God says yes, He doesn't just nod. He shines His light upon your path, making your journey all the more extraordinary. Stepping stones God has placed on your journey. You know, the times when you're in the midst of a storm and the path ahead is shrouded in uncertainty, it's essential to remember that these trials and tribulations aren't roadblocks. They are the very stepping stones God has placed on your journey. Think about the Israelites wandering through the desert before they reached the Promised Land. They faced hardship and obstacles, just as we do. In James chapter 1, verses 2 through 3, we're reminded to consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. So, when life's challenges come knocking at your door, don't be disheartened. Instead, view them as opportunities for growth and endurance. God is using these difficulties to mold you into the person He intends you to be. Now, let's shift our focus to that gentle whisper in your heart, that nudge you feel when God is guiding you towards a decision. It's a feeling of peace that washes over you, a sense of calm amidst the uncertainty. This, my friends, is divine guidance at its finest. Philippians chapter 4, verse 7 assures us that the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. When you find yourself at a crossroads and that inexplicable peace accompanies your decision, it's a clear sign that God is saying yes. Remember, God speaks to us not just through the stillness of our hearts, but also through the voices of those around us. Seek wisdom and counsel from trusted sources for God often uses them to reaffirm His plans for you. When God gives you a divine green light, He orchestrates the unthinkable. Imagine you're at a crossroads, faced with a monumental decision that could shape your future. You pray, you seek guidance, and you wonder if God is saying yes or no. Well, my friends, I'm here to tell you that when God is saying yes, He's a masterful conductor of circumstances that will leave you in awe. Picture this, a beautiful symphony, each instrument playing a unique role. In your life's orchestra, when you're about to make a significant choice, God steps in as the conductor. He orchestrates people, places, and events in such a way that it becomes undeniable that His hand is at work. It's like when you're on a roller coaster and every twist and turn leaves you breathless with anticipation. God's yes is like that thrilling ride. You'll look back and realize that you couldn't have orchestrated it all on your own. Remember the time when you were contemplating a major career move and suddenly the right job offer appeared out of nowhere, or when you were pondering a life-changing relationship and the perfect person entered your world. Those are the moments when God is saying yes. God's yes is not a magic wand that grants our every wish, nor is it something we should demand. Instead, it's a divine confirmation that aligns with His plan for your life. When circumstances align so perfectly that it's clear God is behind it all, it's time to trust His guidance. In 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 1, the Apostle Paul introduces us to his powerful principle of confirming witnesses. Just as witnesses strengthen a legal case, God often provides us with confirming signs to affirm our decisions, signs that can manifest through His Word, the power of prayer, an unshakable peace settling in your heart, an encouraging word from a fellow believer, or the wise counsel of trusted mentors. Now, let's dive deeper into this concept and explore it through a different lens. I like to call it unlikely circumstances. Think about a person caught up in a situation that appears to have no connection whatsoever to their life's plans. It's as if life has taken a wild detour, leading them down an unforeseen path. Yet, in the midst of this unexpected twist, they suddenly discover themselves aligning perfectly with God's divine purpose. 
Doesn't that sound a bit like the story of Joseph from the book of Genesis? Joseph's journey, marked by treacherous pits and the chains of slavery, might have seemed like a million miles away from leadership and purpose. But here's the remarkable thing. Even in the most challenging and unlikely circumstances, God was meticulously crafting his plan. Joseph couldn't have foreseen the incredible ending to his story. But God was orchestrating every detail, even when things appeared impossibly tough. Now, how does this all tie in with the signs God is saying yes to your next decision? Well, imagine you're facing a big decision in your life, a crossroads, if you will. It could be about your career, a relationship, or a major life change. And here's the kicker. The path forward might seem daunting and uncertain, much like Joseph's early journey. But remember, God specializes in making His presence known in the most unexpected ways. When you're seeking His guidance and wondering if you're on the right track, keep an eye out for those confirming witnesses. It might be a verse from the Bible that speaks directly to your situation, or a sense of profound peace washing over you as you pray. Perhaps a fellow believer unexpectedly offers you a word of encouragement, or a trusted mentor provides you with wise counsel that aligns perfectly with your dilemma. Just as Joseph's life was marked by twists and turns, your life may have its own share of unexpected detours. Yet through it all, God's hand is at work, guiding you towards His purpose for your life. These unlikely circumstances you find yourself in might just be His way of confirming that you're on the right path. In the quiet hours of the night, when the world sleeps and the stars keep watch, there is a sacred space, the time that seems to stand still. It's in these early hours, around 3 a.m., that something extraordinary happens. It's a time when the veil between the divine and the mundane things are lifted, and we find ourselves more open to spiritual encounters. This isn't just any time. It's a time marked by unique spiritual significance, a period that the Bible subtly alludes to in various passages. Imagine this. The world is silent. The distractions of the day have faded, and in this stillness, your heart begins to beat in rhythm with a higher calling. It's 3 a.m., and you find yourself gently nudged awake. This isn't a mere interruption of your sleep. It's a divine invitation. The Bible writes, In the night my soul longs for you. Indeed, my spirit within me seeks you diligently. Isaiah 26, 9. This longing isn't just a feeling. It's a spiritual reality. A moment when God seems to whisper directly to our hearts. Think of Jacob, alone and wrestling in the night. His struggle was not just with man, but with God. It was in the solitude and the darkness that he found his true strength and identity. Like Jacob, we often encounter our deepest spiritual moments, not in the busyness of daylight, but in the quiet wrestlings of the night. This time, the fourth watch, is when miracles unfold in the Bible. It's when Jesus walked on water, calming the sea and the fears of his disciples. It's a time for miracles in our lives, too. It's when we can step out in faith, walking towards Jesus amidst our own storms. In this sacred hour, we're invited to connect with God on a deeper level. Psalm 119, 147 says, I rise before dawn and cry for help. I hope in your words. This hope is more than just a feeling. It's an active, living faith that finds its voice in the stillness of the early morning. This isn't about losing sleep. It's about finding purpose. It's about heeding a spiritual call that stirs us to seek God earnestly. Awake, O harp and lyre. I will awake the dawn. Psalm 108, 2. This isn't just about waking up. It's about awakening something within us, a desire to pursue God with our whole heart. So why does God wake us up at 3 a.m.? It's not to disrupt our rest, but to offer us something more restorative than sleep. It's an invitation to experience His presence, to hear His voice, and to gain clarity and direction for our lives. It's a time to lay our burdens down, to find peace in His presence, and to be filled with hope and strength for the journey ahead. 
let's cherish this quiet rendezvous with the Almighty, where the whispers of God are more audible than ever. Let's consider the story of young Samuel. This tale unfolds in the quiet of the night, where God's voice breaks through the silence, reaching out to Samuel. This isn't just a story about a prophet. It's a reminder of the intimacy of God's communication with us. At 3 a.m., away from the day's distractions, our hearts are more open, our minds more receptive. It's a time when God can impart wisdom, revelations, and a sense of His deep, unconditional love. This hour is not just a random moment in the night. It's a divine appointment. Consider Psalm 42.8. Yet the Lord will command His loving kindness in the daytime, and in the night His song shall be with me in my prayer unto the God of my life." Which beautifully articulates how God's presence encompasses us day and night. The night is not a time of fear or uncertainty, but a canvas for the celestial symphony of God's love. It's an opportunity for transformational encounters, for heartfelt prayers and worship that transcends mere ritual. Some have associated 3 a.m. with darkness, even calling it the witching hour. There's a belief that supernatural forces are more potent at this time. However, this perception overlooks the omnipresent power of Christ. In Luke 10:19, Jesus says, I have given you authority to tread on serpents and scorpions, and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall hurt you. Our prayers, our connection with God, isn't bound by time or swayed by myths. Furthermore, Ephesians 6.11 reminds us to don the armor of God, to stand firm against any adversarial forces. It's not about fearing the night, but embracing it as a sacred space for divine communication. The night and its quiet are not a ground for fear, but a sanctuary for peace and reflection. In the Gospel of Matthew, when Jesus walks on water, his disciples initially mistake him for a ghost. This moment symbolizes our own sometimes misguided fears at night, misinterpreting the presence of God as something to be afraid of. When God wakes you up at 3 a.m., He's inviting you into a moment of divine encounter. It's a time to lay down the burdens you've carried throughout the day, to surrender your worries and fears, and to receive His guidance and comfort. In Psalm 119, 62, David says, At midnight I will rise to give thanks to you because of your righteous judgments. This verse reflects the essence of those nighttime awakenings, a call to gratitude, reflection, and a recognition of God's presence in our lives. Moreover, these early morning hours can be a time for intercessory prayer. Just as Esther called for a fast at night before approaching the king for her people's salvation, our prayers in the stillness can intercede for the needs of those around us and bring about change in the spiritual realm. Perhaps in these quiet hours, God's also reminding us of His constant vigilance and care. As Psalm 121.4 reassures us, He who keeps Israel shall neither slumber nor sleep. Even when we're unaware, God's actively working in our lives, protecting and guiding us. So, the next time you find yourself awake at 3 a.m., consider it a divine appointment. It's a time to be still and know that He is God. Embrace the quiet, listen for His voice, and let His peace fill your heart. In these moments, you'll find the strength for the day ahead, wisdom for the decisions you face, and comfort in knowing you're never alone. These wakeful nights are not just random occurrences. They're opportunities for deeper connection with our Creator. They're moments to cherish, to learn, and to grow. In the embrace of the night, let your soul be rejuvenated and your faith be strengthened. Remember, God's timing is perfect, and His purpose in waking you is always for your good and His glory. Consider the biblical reference in Psalm 91, 5-7. You will not fear the terror of night, nor the arrow that flies by day, nor the pestilence that stalks in the darkness, nor the plague that destroys at midday. A thousand may fall at your side, ten thousand at your right hand, but it will not come near you. Assures us of God's protection against the terrors of the night. This verse isn't just about comfort, 
It's about empowerment. It reminds us that in the seemingly daunting hours of the night, we're not vulnerable. We're actually at our strongest, standing guard in prayer, aligning our hearts and minds with God's will. Embracing this sacred hour is an act of love and devotion. It's a testament to your commitment to God, showing Him that your desire for His presence surpasses even the sweet allure of sleep. This sacrifice, this act of waking up at such an unconventional hour, is your personal offering to God, a demonstration that your relationship with Him is your utmost priority. When the world sleeps, distractions are minimal. The spiritual realm is calm, and your prayers ascend to God like a fragrant offering, unimpeded by the chaos of daily life. In the solitude, you're granted clarity. The voice of God, often a gentle whisper, becomes clearer, guiding you, comforting you, and revealing the depths of His love and plans for you. Engaging in prayer at 3 a.m. is more powerful than a ritual. It's a journey deeper into your spiritual life. It's an exploration of the intimate relationship you share with God. You begin to understand His character more deeply, experiencing His love and grace in new dimensions. And here's the most beautiful part. God anticipates these moments with you. Imagine the Creator of the universe waiting eagerly to meet you, to listen to you, to speak to you. You don't need an alarm clock for this appointment. God's love is your wake-up call. Waking up at 3 a.m. to pray is a unique and profound practice. It's a time to engage in spiritual warfare, to offer a personal sacrifice of love to God, and to experience His presence in a powerful, unobstructed manner. This hour is not just a moment in time. It's a divine invitation to deepen your relationship with God, to hear His voice more clearly, and to align yourself with His will. So the next time you find yourself awake at 3 a.m., see it as a call to something greater, a call to be in the presence of the Almighty in the quiet, sacred hours of the night. The Death of Lamentations 3, 22-23, which says, His compassions never fail. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. This verse reminds us that each day, including its earliest hours, brings a fresh outpouring of God's mercy and love. When you wake up at 3 a.m., it's as if God is providing you with a blank canvas, a new beginning, inviting you to paint your worries, hopes, and dreams in prayer. These pre-dawn hours are also a sanctuary for confronting what lies deep within us. Here in the quiet, you can bring your fears, your doubts, and even your failures into the light of His grace. It's a time for spiritual detox, a cleansing of the soul, where you can lay down your burdens and feel the weight lift off your shoulders. In this divine solitude, you're reminded that you're never alone in your journey. God's grace is like a river, constantly flowing, ready to renew and refresh your spirit. Moreover, this time is ideal for immersing yourself in the scriptures. With a clear mind, free from the day's clutter, God's word shines like a beacon. In these quiet moments, the Bible isn't just a book. It becomes a living dialogue between you and God. The words leap off the page, offering guidance, comfort, and a wisdom that resonates deep within your heart. The Lord desires to meet you in a place where the world's distractions cannot reach. It's a divine appointment, a time set aside for you to grow, to heal, and to be enveloped in His love. Embrace these moments. Let them be a time of spiritual awakening, where you can reflect, recharge, and reconnect with the One who loves you unconditionally. As we conclude, let's bow our heads in a short prayer Dear Lord, thank you for the quiet of the early morning, for the peace it brings, and for the opportunity to be alone with you. Help us to listen to your voice, to be guided by your word, and to feel your presence in every moment of stillness. Amen. I believe no matter what you've been through, God can give you a great victory so that your past fades away in the background like it never existed. God is saying your time is coming. Hold on in faith and trust in God. He will give you that victory.
Do you ever feel like giving up on your dreams, yourself, and the promise God once told you you'd reach and have? Do you ever wonder if you have what it takes to succeed on this journey? Do you ever find yourself doubting that great future God promised you, wondering if it would come and if you'll have everything it takes to reach it? If you answered yes to any of these questions, you're not alone. Many great Christians whom you may have read of in the Bible or see in modern times struggle with self-confidence and motivation, especially when facing challenges and setbacks that make everything they believe in feel like a lie. However, just like them, you can overcome these obstacles and reach your destiny through the resilience of faith. When we read Romans chapter 4, verse 18 to 21, we see a picture of this in the life of Abraham. It says, Against all hope, Abraham in hope believed and so became the father of many nations, just as it had been said unto him. So shall your offspring be. Without weakening in his faith, he faced the fact that his body was as good as dead, since he was about a hundred years old at that time, and that Sarah's room was also dead. Yet he did not waver through unbelief regarding the promise of God, but was strengthened in his faith and gave glory to God, being fully persuaded that God had power to do what he had promised. You may ask, what does this resilience of faith mean? Resilience of faith is the ability of your faith to bounce back from or during adversity and keep moving forward regardless of contradicting circumstances. It's a powerful spiritual quality that allows you to face whatever life throws your way with courage and strong confidence in God, to learn from your setbacks and grow stronger. Do you think you have resilience of faith? Can your faith hold on long enough until your time comes? Can you keep seeing victory up ahead despite being surrounded by defeat and setbacks? You see, resilience of faith is not something you're born with, but something you can develop through practice and perseverance in your walk with God through life's journey. Let me share one of the most inspiring examples of resilience I've ever encountered. This is the story of the life of John Smith. We call him John Smith because he agreed to share his story under the condition of anonymity. So we have to respect that. John Smith is a successful entrepreneur, author, and speaker who has built a multi-million dollar business from scratch. But his journey was not easy or smooth. In fact, he had to overcome many hardships and obstacles along the way. John Smith was born into a poor family in a developing country. He grew up in a slum where he had to work from an early age to help his parents and siblings survive. He didn't have access to quality education, health care, or basic amenities. He faced discrimination, violence, and corruption on a daily basis. He didn't have any role models or mentors to guide or inspire him. John Smith was by himself. But John Smith had a dream. He believed that God placed a vision in his heart and gave him the heart to pursue it with everything he had. He wanted to make a difference in the world. He wanted to create something of value that would help others live better lives. John Smith found that the only way to achieve his dream was through the help of God, education, and hard work. He knew that if he didn't let God lead him, or if he didn't study well and push himself hard, he wouldn't reach the pinnacle of that vision God placed in his heart to one day own a company that would improve the lives of millions worldwide. So he studied hard, despite the lack of resources and opportunities. He kept praying, trusting God, and standing on his word. He read more and more books, watched videos, listened to podcasts, and learned everything he could about business, leadership, and personal development. Despite the lack of support and recognition, John continued to work hard at developing and mastering his skill. He started his first business when he was 16 years old, selling snacks on the street. He saved every penny he earned and reinvested it in his business. Then he expanded his product range, hired employees, and opened new locations. He faced many challenges and risks such as competition, theft, regulations, and taxes. 
He also met many failures and losses, such as bankruptcy, lawsuits, and fraud. There were days where it seemed like John wasn't making any headway. Days when everything seemed to be working against him, but John Smith never gave up. He never lost sight of his vision and his values. He never stopped trusting the Lord. He never stopped learning and improving himself. He never stopped working and innovating. He never stopped believing in himself and his potential, and he believed that one day, everything God told him would come to pass. He believed that his time was coming, and he was determined to wait for it, no matter what. John used every setback as a stepping stone to success. He used every obstacle as an opportunity to grow. He used every criticism as feedback to improve. He used every failure as a lesson to learn. He also used every success as motivation to do more. He used every achievement as a validation of his efforts. He used every compliment as encouragement to continue. He used every milestone as a celebration of his progress. But most of all, he stood on the integrity of God's word as his bridge to his fulfillment. John used every opportunity as a platform to give back to those around him and those he believed God was sending to him. He used every resource as a tool to help others. He used every influence as a responsibility to inspire. Today, John has become one of the most respected and admired entrepreneurs. His businesses span across multiple industries and markets, creating value for millions of customers and stakeholders. His books and speeches have reached millions of readers and listeners, empowering them with knowledge and wisdom. His philanthropy and activism have touched millions of lives, improving them with compassion and generosity. But John Smith is not done yet. He still has many dreams and goals to pursue. He still has many challenges and problems to solve. He still has many opportunities to explore. Although he isn't where God told him yet, even though he appears successful to everyone else, John still lives daily in faith. He believes that his time is coming and he will walk in everything that God ordained for him to walk in. He still has resilience. He still has that faith that keeps him going, whether he wins or loses, rises or falls. But do you know that this resilience of faith is not just the lot of John, but of every child of God? The Bible says that God has given each one of us a measure of faith. Romans chapter 12 verse 3 For by the grace given me I say to every one of you, do not think of yourself more highly than you ought, but rather think of yourself with sober judgment in accordance with the faith God has distributed to each of you. This means you also have faith that can develop a resilient quality that keeps you believing, keeps you trusting God, and keeps you seeing that someday your time will come. Beloved, do you know that you have the power to overcome any adversity and achieve any goal? You have the potential to create any value and make any difference. You have the passion to pursue any dream and live any life according to God's will. You just need resilient faith. It will keep you going in the day of challenges. So how do you develop resilient faith? Please remember that resilience of faith is not a destination, but a journey. It's not a trait, but a skill. It's not a gift, but the product of a choice. The Bible says in Romans chapter 10, verse 17, Consequently, faith comes from hearing the message, and the message is heard through the word about Christ. Resilience of faith starts with the word of God, but this is not where it ends. To develop the quality of resilience in your faith, you must develop your faith further by constantly trusting God to fulfill his words in your life. This will involve you, just like Abraham in the Bible and John Smith in our story, to engage yourself in what God has placed in your heart. It will require you to keep coming back no matter how many times you fail. This is not just because you are resolved, but because you believe this is what God has called you to pursue. Beloved, 
God is saying your time has come. In this day and age, when there's so much pressure and disappointment, please remember the words of Jesus in John 14, verse 1. Do not let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God. Believe also in me. Don't lose your faith. Stand strong. Wake up every day. Go to that office, not because it's the friendliest place, but because that is where God has told you to stay and grow. Listen. In this journey of life, those who develop a faith that can bounce back from pressure and keep on going will survive and win. Don't be found missing when your time comes. Stand strong in your faith and keep trusting in God. Your time is coming. Don't give up. As long as God keeps you alive, there's a hope of something coming. Would you miss something so great because of a short season of pain? Paul wrote in Romans 8, verse 18, I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. Be reminded that what you're going through today is not worth comparing to what's coming. Stay hopeful, stay trusting, stay with God. Don't let the pressure get to you. Keep doing what God says you should do. Don't let anyone intimidate you with their own success. No, stand strong and stand faithful.